they are very far from everything. They have no sugar, they have no coffee. The only thing they can find in Tundra is fish and reindeer. They will not change their life. They don't want to go in the city. They don't want to, to be a part of the civilization. They have made the choice to live in the Tundra. They like to be in this uh, special universe between the, the ground and the sky. There is nothing. They are the only human living in this incredible uh, country. of nomads and explorers is science's game. These precious mammoth remains will be flown to Hatanga for safekeeping and further studies of the animal's little known domain. They'll meet again in September when the second Jarkov mammoth expedition gets underway. In Hatanga, the first snows of autumn herald the new season, and with it, the return to unfinished business on the Taimir. Final preparations are underway for the second Jarkov mammoth expedition, and the mammoth experts from the Netherlands and the United States have just arrived. Before the team hits the road, Deke Moll and Larry Agenbrod are eager to have a look at Bernard Summer finds. For two dyed-in-the-wool mammoth fans, this collection of woolly mammoth artifacts is a treasure trove. Mm -hmm. But uh, a full-grown one, so that means an old, you can see it from the jaw yeah, of the epiphyses which are fused with the yeah. diaphyses. This is beautiful quality. <laughs> This time, an advanced team has been sent on with some of the heavier gear. The goal is to prep the site so that the mammoth lift will get underway before bad weather sets in. And they're off. The tracks in this great Arctic desert lead down a lost road. The entire northern hemisphere was once a playground for the woolly mammoth, an animal that had adapted to the most extreme climates on the planet. Why animals so well buffered against extinction disappeared is a question that baffles the scientists. The Jarkov mammoth will provide the clues they're looking for.
It's mid-September when the helicopter sets down at the dig site, loaded with a few tons of cargo and the expectations of two dozen men. The scientists waste little time getting to know their subject. Two meters and uh, 98 centimeters. It's the first time they've seen the Jarkov tusks, and their curiosity's gotten the better of them. And we need uh, the circle, friends. The American and Dutchman are joined by Russian zoologist Alexei Tikhonov who studied with Professor Vera Shagin. And we need to write down the weight, the right tusk. A tusk can reveal the sex and state of health of the animal, according to Larry Agenbrod, and even the season it died. The tusk is kind of the unwritten diary for mammoths. These are exceptional tusks. They're better than any I've seen except in living animals. They're the highest quality fossil ivory I've ever seen. The Russian crew has made progress in the weeks before Bernard arrives. A block the size of a woolly mammoth begins to emerge from the tundra. Breaking through ice and permafrost takes muscle, and even in such extreme cold, the men quickly work up a dangerous sweat. To prevent hypothermia, they dig in shifts. One hour of labor, one of rest. As their link to the outside world vanishes into the night, the men set about the business of becoming a team again. An expedition cook prepares the meals this time around, but it's hardly gourmet fare in a land of starch and reindeer steaks. It's the first gathering of this Franco-Russian expedition, and somewhat subdued, at least until the men figure out how to communicate in a strange mix of Russian, French, English, and Dutch. Without heavy equipment, only manpower, Bernard thinks he can raise the mammoth in about a month. But for some of the team, memories of the battle they lost to the Jarkov mammoth still haunt them. Several days pass and the quarry of permafrost and ice is growing around the perimeter of the hole. But it's slow going, even with everyone pitching in. There's an unforeseen glitch. Their generator isn't strong enough to power tools, but it's not the only